All right, good evening and welcome to a regular meeting of Manhasset School Board. If we have a full quorum, if we could please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I think we have some honorees to start off the evening tonight. Yes, we do. So I'd like to invite up uh, Connie Bruno from CASA, and I'd like to invite up Dr. Coleman from Broadcast Journalism to uh, lead us through tonight's very exciting recognition. Good evening. My name is Connie Bruno, and I am with Manhasset CASA. CASA has been operating in the community for over 20 years to raise awareness on underage substance use, gambling, and mental health. One of the most powerful tools that there is with youth is youth-to-youth -youth marketing. So about three years ago, I approached Dr. Coleman about utilizing his students and his broadcast studio to create public service announcements in support of our mission. And that's how the public service announcement award was came about. This is the third year and I'll turn it over to Dr. Coleman to sure. say a few words. Absolutely. Thank you everyone. And, and welcome to, uh, to the wonderful students that are here. Um, Connie, thank you. So students produce poignant, public service announcements that encompass essential issues that are aligned with CASA. And NBC is so thankful to have a wonderful partner in CASA to provide these opportunities to students in a competition. So we're very excited tonight to share the third, second, and first place winners of the third annual competition. Students, uh, please come up as your PSA is recognized. In third place, with their PSA, pay attention. We have George Hogan, Vinnie Amato, and Blake Seeley. Prize, of course. Um, come over here. Yes, yes. <laughs> In second place with their PSA, there is more to a story. Maria Capsalis, Casey Hilton, and Rashida Punawala. And in first place, with her PSA, to be great or nothing, Chloe Pusey.
Congratulations, students. The PSAs can be watched on the Manhasset Broadcasting Company YouTube page. Thank you, everybody. No, congratulations, and Connie, uh, just everything you do at CASA, we are tremendously thankful. You are the heart and soul of that organization, and uh, just a round of applause for Connie and everything she does there. And Dr. And Dr. Coleman, not for nothing, you know, we get to see you a lot with NBC, and you just, you continue to impress and continue to put it out, so thank you for everything you do. Um, and from there, we'll, oh, students, families of students, uh, you are more than welcome to leave at this time if you'd like. If you have homework, if you'd like to stay, you're also welcome to stay. But um, if you want to casually, subtly. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Enjoy your evenings. Right. So first on the agenda tonight is the approval of amendments from the last meeting. All in favor? Thank you. And that brings us right to our superintendent's report. Okay. Thank you, Steve. I hope everyone was able to enjoy some time with their families and friends last week while school was closed for the holiday. Um, as you know, on Monday, April 8th, um, our area will experience a partial solar eclipse. Uh, with the peak of the event taking place at 3.26 p.m., when the sun will be approximately 91% covered by the moon. Uh, this celestial event provides unique learning opportunity for students of all ages, uh, and we're committed to ensuring that's both safe and informative for everyone involved. So Dr. Gately sent a letter to the school community earlier today. Um, and to support our teachers in making the most of the event, Dr. Gately and Dr. McGrath have provided resources for all grades, including lesson plan ideas and activities that highlight this rare astronomical event. Um, the resources are designed to engage students and deepen their understanding of the solar system and the natural world around them. The lessons and activities will be conducted in all of our schools throughout the day. Along with the unique learning opportunity, we will be discussing safety information with our students prior to the eclipse. We'll be providing each student and staff member with solar eclipse glasses to protect their eyes during the event. Uh, the glasses have been certified for safe solar viewing and will allow students to observe the eclipse safely. So any parent or community member that, um, that does not want their child to view the eclipse should um, contact their child's principal. Uh, but each school will take their children outside for a short viewing before dismissal. Students will be dismissed from each school at regular times and will be reminded to only look at the eclipse while wearing specialized solar viewing glasses because, as you know, could could cause damage to your eyes. Um, given the timing of the eclipse, the athletic department will not hold middle school practices on Monday afternoon. High school practices will be pushed back to a later start time and home games are scheduled for 5 p.m. So they, they, they will not be impacted. Um, in other news, the uh, mural restoration project at Muncie Park has been completed, and I wanted to take a moment to thank the Tower Foundation and the SCA for partnering to fund the restoration project. Uh, it was 24 years ago that Muncie Park art teacher Mark Fay beautified the walls of Muncie Park Elementary School. Uh, even though Mr. Fay has been retired for 10 years, he continues to be a regular powerful presence at Muncie Park. Uh, this January, he began the restoration project in the foyer and in the cafeteria, which, um, which the foyer connected the original building to the additions that were built in 1997. And I encourage you all to take a look next time you're at Muncie Park because the murals are stunning and the detail is very impressive. We are so very grateful to Mr. Fay for his work on this important project and we're grateful to the SEA and the Tower Foundation for funding the restoration initiative. So let me now transition to tonight's agenda. 
On tonight's agenda, you will see a very exciting appointment. Uh, tonight, we are recommending the appointment of Laura Peterson to the position of Executive Director for Student Services. Ms. Peterson will be, re uh, will be replacing, although she is irreplaceable, Ms. Allison Rushforth, who is retiring at the end of this school year. Ms. Peterson comes to us from the Hewlett Woodmere School District, where she is currently the Assistant Superintendent for Special Education and Student Support Services. Prior to this role, Ms. Peterson was the Director of Pupil Services in Valley Stream District 24. She has prior experience as a special education teacher and department chairperson in the East Rockaway School District. And we are thrilled to recommend her appointment to this important position in the Manhasset School District. And we look forward to her leadership in the area of student services. So I'd like to just take a moment to welcome Ms. Peterson if she can come up and we could take a quick picture with her. Thank you, graduate. I apologize to the board in advance, but we're going to get up one more time. Uh, because also on tonight's agenda is the acceptance of a generous gift from the Manhasset PAL Lacrosse Organization. And I'd like to thank Mr. Frank Coglin for spearheading this donation. The, do the donation will be used toward the restoration of Memorial Field. Memorial Field is a grass field, as you know, and this gift will fund organic topsoil, leveling, and overseeding. And Frank, as always, we're so grateful for your partnership, and we're grateful for your, for your, for your organization's generosity, and we're grateful for, the, for your regular presence in our school district. So thank you, Frank. You'd like to come up. We want to accept the first. So before before we do that, let's just uh, all in favor of accepting the gift on the agenda. All right, there we go. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, Steve. That's my report. Thank you very much. I just real quick note on um, Mr. Coughlin that thank first, thank you very much. But if you have not been to a, uh, a men's lacrosse or women's lacrosse game, um, if you don't want to stay for the entire game, I recommend that you get there at the beginning of it for his rendition of the Star Spangled Banner, which is beautiful. He uh, has joined the choir and he's really, uh, he's taken it to another level. So I highly recommend coming out and watching and listening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's come a long way, but Frank, thank you for everything you do there. Thank you. All right, so any questions about the superintendent's report? No? All right. Sophia, what do you got? Hi, so from my report, I just wanted to address some of the questions that were asked at the last board meeting regarding distributed funds. 
So previous to expired to class expired funds have gone typically um, to student senate, which has no typical expenditures. As a result, the account is nearly twenty-five thousand dollars. It is often acted as credit to classes that had little startup monies. Instead, this year we're going to gift the underclasses directly. We discussed these holdover monies from the last year's class, and we'll be doing that as a gift, as Steve asked about. And further to Aaron's questions, monies raised go towards prom expenses and class gifts. So this re redistribution will make it easier for each class to afford the increasing expenses um, we face by catering halls and entertainment. So for example, um, the DJ for, for prom this year is about $2,400. So yeah, that's what I have for tonight. Thank you. Prom's tomorrow night, right? Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> Enjoy. Stay put. All right. Last <laughs> you're home safe, Sophia. Thank you so much for, for clarifying those questions. Thank you. All right. Any questions? You're up. Okay, thank you. James, can you put up the presentation? Okay, so uh, tonight we have our second informal budget hearing. I plan to go through the preliminary budget again for the board's consideration. And after my presentation, we'll take questions from the board and the community. We've also added some information based on feedback that we've received through, um, uh, th through various individuals since the board meeting. So uh, tonight's presentation, tonight's presentation is designed uh, as follows, we'll review the we'll review the district's timeline. We'll talk about the priority areas. We'll of course review projected elementary class size, and as I said previously, we'll also have an opportunity for questions and answers. For ease, we've included links to each of the previous presentations for the community to review. The presentations are posted on our website, and this is just uh, a quick outline of the budget development timeline. So the district's priority areas identify the goals for the 24-25 budget, and our priority areas include strengthening academic uh, extracurricular experiences, investing in facilities, enhancing professional development, and forging strong connections. We have crafted a budget that manages the complexities of this year's challenging uh, financial environment, and our budget development goals include the following. We are, of course, supporting the district's priority areas. We're serving to preserve the strong academic programs K-12 with a particular focus on class size, expanding academic offerings at the secondary school, maintain and upgrading our aging facilities infrastructure, enhancing our instructional technology infrastructure and instructional software, bolstering security staffing in all three of our schools, maintaining and enhancing support for the social and emotional wellness of students. And of course, we are continuing to operate within the property tax cap. In fact, we are uh, committed to fiscal response to presenting a fiscally responsible budget that reflects our commitment to operating within the allowable property tax cap. This year, our preliminary 3.3 percent budget to budget increase totaling 3.553 million dollars is within the 2.68 percent property tax cap for 24-25. It is important to note that more than one million dollars of necessary reductions were taken to comply with the tax cap and again we'll discuss that in a few moments. Um, I showed the slide at the last presentation because since my initial budget presentation, a question was received asking how the size of our budget compares to other Nassau County districts with a similar enrollment. And again, on this slide, uh, school districts are sorted by, en by enrollment, and you'll see Manhasset is right in the middle with the orange. What I've done is I took the, um, I, I took the districts with a larger enrollment and districts with a smaller enrollment than ours, and you can see that the average enrollment of these total 15 districts, including Manhasset, was approximately 3,000 students. And the average budget was approximately $10 million more than Manhasset's. Manhasset's 23-24 budget per pupil is approximately 10% lower than the average of these other districts. 
And again, you'll see that I've highlighted a few of the other high achieving districts for comparison. And again, with this in mind, we should acknowledge how much we've achieved programmatically with a smaller average budget than our peers. So let's just discuss once again why this is the case. To understand why the size of our budget is what it is in comparison to other districts, we need to examine our historical budget to budget increases as each budget builds the foundation for future years. Prior to 2009-10, you can see the level of budget to budget increase the district had each year. In 2009-10, because of the Wall Street financial crisis, which significantly impacted Manhasset residents, it was determined to put forth a zero budget increase. The 0.87% shown on the chart accounts only for $700,000 of new debt services with no other budget increase. In the context of the time, this was a well-reasoned decision. Had we had the ability to add a typical incremental 2% in the budget, it would have yielded an incremental increase of about $1.6 million. In 2012-13, the property tax cap was enacted, leading to a limited tax levy increase of $119,000 in 13-14 on an $87 million budget. This was insufficient and would have required a budget decrease uh, and, and would have, uh, this was insufficient and would have required a budget decrease of $2.3 million. So in 12-13, the district sought voter approval to pierce the tax cap. That budget failed to receive the necessary voter approval, resulting in a contingent budget with a $900,000 decrease from 1213, which was approved. However, instead of having a normal budget increase of about $2.2 million, the result was a $3.1 million negative swing. This is a slide that we've added since our last presentation. The cumulative impact of the 2009-10 zero budget increase and the 13-14 budget to budget decrease had a seismic effect on our budget in the ensuing years. The reality is, if these two events had not occurred, the 23-24 budget would be approximately $6.1 million higher than it is today. Obviously, an incremental $6.1 million in our budget would still bring us below the average, but much closer to other similarly sized Nassau County districts included in the prior chart. Aside from the impact on any year's individual budget, such erosion has other long-term impacts. Astoundingly, if the two events in 9-10 and 13-14 had not occurred, the district would have had available incremental budget funds totaling $67 million over the last 15 years. And you can see that in, uh, in this chart where on the green line, we give you the hypothetical of what would have happened if this did not occur, and the actual you can see on the, you can see on the bottom. So on that note, let's pivot to the second question, which is why doesn't the district have more money in its reserves? In addition to the events I previously noted, since the district adopted a tax cap mentality in 2009-10, well before the actual imposition of the property tax cap law, the average budget-to-budget -budget increase over the last 15 years was 1.98%. During the period from 2009-2010 through 2012-2013, the district used reserves of at least $1 million each year to blunt the effect of the zero budget to budget increase in 2009-10. An anticipated reduction in debt services in 13-14 was meant to replace the use of reserves, but unfortunately the rules of the tax cap disallowed that strategy because debt service is an exclusion in the tax cap calculation. Therefore, the district's reliance on reserves to bridge the gap in those years prior uh, further compounded the issues in 13-14. The erosion of the budget foundation in 2009-10 and 1314, along with an average budget to budget increase of 1.98%, especially when viewed through the lens of the steep rise in certain costs, such as benefits over the last several years, sets the stage for an incredibly tight budget process that leaves very little money uh, left over in any school year to fund reserves. I'd like to, I, I, I think you would agree that our reserve picture would have looked significantly different 
had the district had the incremental budget funds over the period totaling $67 million. Generally, we have placed any leftover money we have in our capital reserve for use on large scale capital projects in years between bond issuances as shown on this slide. I'd also like to point out that we had designated fund balance in 1920 for COVID related expenses for FEMA. And as I've mentioned on several occasions, we're actively seeing re seeking reimbursement uh, for these expenses from FEMA. And to date, we have recovered uh, $1.4 million in the current year. Uh, in addition, an incremental $2.7 million has been presented to FEMA and is pending review. Our initiative to recover these funds has neutralized the impact of the governor's proposed $629,000 reduction in state aid, which we'll discuss later on in the presentation. It has also allowed us to make one-time purchases to limit reductions necessary in the 24-25 budget to enable our compliance with the 24-25 property tax cap. So with this background in mind, let's pivot to the 24-25 budget. The budget for each school year is intended to stand on its own. In each year, the amount of allowable budget increase is defined by the property tax cap. As a reminder, in 24-25, the property tax cap only allows for a net increase of $3.5 million. And as I stated previously, more than $1 million of necessary reductions were taken to comply with the property tax cap. Staffing accounts for 75% of our budget. Special education services, other than compensation, account for 5% of the budget. And 20% of our budget is made up of all other expenditures. Within that 75% that includes compensation and benefits, certain non-discretionary components are dictated by our collective bargaining agreements. Special education costs are mandated as determined by a child's individual education plan. And while certain components of staffing are non-discretionary, certain elements of staffing are discretionary. For example, class size, course offerings, and certain support staff assignments. So let's just take a closer look at the 75% of the budget that is compensation and benefits. Very significant drivers included in this year's budget include active and retiree healthcare costs and pension contributions, all of which have percentage increases that are in the double digits in a 2% tax cap environment. 25% of the overall budget is benefits, yet the increase in benefits takes up 36% of the 24-25 budget increase. We've managed this impact in part with certain staff reductions, which we will discuss later in the presentation, totaling a net impact of more than $800,000. This represents a minus 0.75% of the budget increase. So with our priority areas in mind, let's talk about what is included in the expenditure side of the budget. The budget preserves our strong elementary program with a particular focus on class size, which I will detail later on in the presentation. Over the last several years, we've made significant investments in staffing to support students and teachers. This slide includes the staffing levels for our general education specialists, academic support teachers, enrichment, and staff development at the elementary school. In our investment in specialists, combined with the diligent work of our faculty, our staff, alongside our investment in curriculum development has paid off. As you'll recall from the data presentations, Student achievement has increased at all levels, and most remarkably can be seen in double digit increases in SAT scores and significant increases in successful participation in advanced placement courses. Last year's graduating class had almost 90% of their students achieving an advanced regents diploma, the highest diploma offered in New York State. Based on conversations and questions we've received from the community, we've clarified information on this slide specific to our elementary special education program. <clears throat> this year, we've piloted two important enhancements to our elementary instructional model for students with disabilities. We've enhanced our integrated co-teaching model, and we've changed our approach to special class pullouts for skill-based instruction. In our previous integrated co-teaching model, the special education teacher was in the classroom for half a day, 
and the remaining part of the day was covered by a teaching assistant who provided support to students in the absence of the special education teacher. In our new model, we enhanced our elementary co-teaching program to include a special education teacher in the classroom throughout the day with the general education teacher. In this best practice model, the two teachers share teaching responsibilities throughout the day. They build inclusive learning communities that provide full access to the general education curriculum for students with disabilities in typical grade level classrooms with their peers. With respect to our special class pullout model, our previous model removed some students with disabilities from their general education classroom to receive primary instruction in reading and or math in homogenous groups from a special education teacher in a different location. Because students were removed from the general education classroom for primary instruction, they had reduced exposure to the entirety of the grade level curriculum. This is a more restrictive approach that prevented students with disabilities from learning reading and or math in typical grade level classrooms with their peers. In our new model, students previously assigned to special class pullouts are now in the full day integrated co-teaching classroom with two full-time teachers. Those students who need additional skill-based support receive their primary reading and math instruction in the classroom and they receive additional supplemental skill-based instruction from a reading and or math specialist in accordance with their individual education plan. We've received a question regarding the inclusion of the students who received special class pullout instruction in reading and or math into the integrated co-teaching classroom. In this year's pilot, we've been asked, how have the two teachers in an integrated co-teaching classroom supported students of a wider range of abilities during primary instruction for reading and math, particularly in the context of whether students should be grouped homogeneously or heterogeneously. The essence of integrated co-teaching is to include students with disabilities in the general education classroom. Integrated co-teaching is a best practice over separating students with disabilities from their grade level peers and is a least restrictive setting for most students. This year on average, an integrated co-teaching class has seven students with disabilities. Next year's full-time special education teacher in the integrated co-teaching classes will have a similar average of seven students with disabilities in the classroom. As you know, we have fully adopted an elementary reading and writing curriculum that blends the workshop model with the science of reading strategies. Our curriculum approach emphasizes differentiation of instruction in the classroom for all students. No more are students using one anchor text for their reading, for their reading curriculum. Our, our elementary classrooms are full of classroom libraries with books on individual student levels. Because of the emphasis on differentiation of instruction and the full adoption of our blended pedagogical approach, has made possible the integration of students who received special class pullout instruction to now be included in the primary instruction of reading and math in our co-teaching classrooms. This year, consistent with the research and the successful implementation of our reading and writing curriculum, we have seen significant growth in many students in their reading levels. We attribute this growth to the fact that students who previously received special class pullout instruction are now receiving a double dose of reading instruction. Primary instruction is occurring from a reading specialist at a frequency based on the student's individual needs and, uh, and supplemental instruction, sorry, primary instruction is occurring in the classroom every day and supplemental instruction is occurring from a reading specialist at a frequency based on the student's need. In essence, giving students more exposure to the reading and mathematics curriculum. The second question that we have received is should supplemental instruction be given by the special education teacher rather than the subject area specialist? Similar to the previous model, primary instruction continues to be provided by a special educator. The difference is that primary instruction now takes place in the integrated co-teaching classroom. Therefore, it is appropriate to provide supplemental instruction from a content specialist with specialized skills and training for skill development. Our students are now receiving more instruction than they were receiving in the previous model, 
In fact, over the past several years, we've added reading and math specialists at the elementary level to provide the supplemental instructional support. And consistent with our longstanding deliberative process, we will continue to monitor the effectiveness of our programs for each child and recommend adjustments as necessary. The district has an administrator for assessment and data analysis who consistently monitors each child's growth and works with our administrators and classroom teachers to identify and address the individual learning needs of our students. At the secondary school, the budget supports lowered class size with, an addition, with additional FTEs added to social studies, English, mathematics, and world language. Expansion of classes based on student enrollment in advanced placement and support classes. Expansion of course offerings to include AP Macroeconomics, Virtual Enterprise, which is an exciting new course that includes workplace simulations, where we are reintroducing a course in business law and we're starting a new world language pathway in Mandarin. The budget also supports the expansion of the science research program from eight periods a day to nine periods a day, allowing for the separation of advanced one and advanced two students and increased sections of the senior course STS prep. In addition, the expansion of the engineering classes is the result of a higher rate of retention in our engineering pathway. As you know, we have requested a review from Nassau County Homeland Security. Among their recommendations are an additional security guard at each elementary school with a focus on perimeter security. The budget includes the addition of these positions. In addition, we're adding a full-time teaching assistant to the Middle School Wellness Learning Center to support the various programmatic initiatives that take place in that space. So as we previously discussed, 75% of the budget consists of compensation and benefits. However, only 56% of the budget increase relates to compensation and benefits. 25% of the 24-25 budget drives 44% of the budget increase. So let's discuss why. We'll go into detail in each of the categories listed on the slide, but first, with respect to transportation, you'll note a decrease in contract transportation. This is due to efficiencies in route configuration and will not impact after-school bus runs. With respect to special education, the primary expense driver is the increase in the number of and cost of out-of-district placements. In addition, we have budgeted for the new unfunded mandate that requires us to educate uh, special education students through their 22nd year. Our uh, increase would have been less by $181,000 had this, had this not been mandated. In addition, contract therapists provide services to students with an IEP that includes assistive technology, occupational therapy, nursing services, auditory and visual therapy. The cost of these services increased 18% in 23-24, and are budgeted to increase 11% in 24-25. This represents a 30% increase over two years on a line item that now totals $1.85 million. This slide focuses on information technology other than compensation. Importantly, the budget continues to support our equipment rotation program, which is critically important because as you know, technology is an integral part of our instructional program. The Teachers College Reading and Writing Project, which I spoke about earlier, is now fully adopted and blends the workshop model with the science of reading. We are emphasizing a shift toward leveraging in-house professional development through our literacy coaches rather than external training through Teachers College. Funding is allocated for the purchase of units of study that have been updated to reflect the science of reading. And additionally, funding supports the purchase of materials for programs such as Just Words, Read 180, K-12 uh, foundations. In addition, we're including funding, funding for targeted professional development and support for our integrated co-teaching program. Funding for curriculum development is also maintained. We've included funding for various curriculum development projects, including those necessary to support the continued transition to the next generation learning standards. One of our district goals centers around facilities. The budget continues to provide funding for a long-term investment in improving our facilities. As an example, we're budgeting for second grade classroom redesign, continuing our commitment to refreshing our elementary classroom spaces. You will note a decrease in the facilities budget due to savings that are anticipated 
in electricity and natural gas as a result of the 2023 energy performance contract. Solar panels, lights, and boiler replacement projects are scheduled to be completed in the end of the summer. As I've said previously, this is a vulnerability in the budget because while we know the solar panels will be installed this summer, we don't know the timing as to when they'll be actually connected to the grid. But we've taken the savings so as not to have to reduce other areas of the budget. Repair and maintenance budget is maintained. Security camera rotation is included, including the purchase of a license plate reader cameras for each of our buildings. The budget reflects the current and anticipated interest rate on the tax anticipation note. In 23-24, the district borrowed $7 million and anticipates borrowing the same in 24-25. There's an offset on, uh, to, the, to this expense in the increase in the interest revenue. The 24-25 budget also includes the next level of debt issuance pursuant to the 2022 bond referendum. Because the bond referendum was previously approved by the voters, the debt services related to the new issuance is exempt from the tax levy calculation. With respect to pupil services, the increase in expense is due to the full funding of our partnership with Northwell Health. This initiative was originally funded in 22-23 through a COVID-related grant, and it's now fully funded in 24-25. The partnership allows the district to partner with a variety of community resources in mental and behavioral health and overall wellness services, and supports and provides guidance and resources in all areas of the mental health and social emotional learning. So as a reminder, 75% of the budget is made up of compensation and benefits, yet 56% of the budget increase is made up of compensation and benefits. To present a balanced budget within the property tax cap, we've made staff reductions that have reduced compensation by a net of $806,000, plus related benefits that include a net reduction in health insurance of $251,000. Again, more than $1 million was taken out of the budget in order to produce a balanced budget that is within the property tax cap. As you know, and as I've said previously, any reduction in staff is difficult as these reductions reflect real people. But with 75% of the budget made up of staffing costs, we had to make some difficult decisions to achieve a balanced budget. The preliminary budget reflects a reduction of 14.45 FTE, and I'll go into these reductions in a moment. So as we discussed from the outset, this budget is crafted in the context of a very challenging fiscal environment. We examined our staffing assignments with an emphasis on lowering class size, primarily through staffing efficiencies. We have added 3.0 elementary teachers to lower class size in grades five and six. I'll go into details later on. We've added 2.5 secondary school teachers to lower class size, support our curriculum expansion, and manage increased enrollment in certain departments. Given the challenging fiscal environment, we are recommending that 3.5 teachers on special assignment be returned to the classroom <clears throat> to help absorb the impact of the staffing reductions I previously outlined. Sorry, the impact of the staffing additions I previously outlined. 4.1 teachers are reduced due to student enrollment and efficiencies in scheduling. And this chart outlines the teachers on special assignment positions that would be returned to traditional classroom teaching positions. Based on conversations and questions we received from the community, we've also clarified the information on this, on this slide specific to our elementary special education program. As discussed previously, slide 14, for those who go and view this uh, on the website, in our previous integrated co-teaching model, the special education teacher was in the classroom for half a day, and the remaining part of the day was covered by a teaching assistant who provided support to the general education teacher and students in the absence of the special education teacher. In 23-24, we budgeted our staffing based on the previous model. We budgeted 24 elementary special education teaching assistants, of which 22 positions are filled, and two positions are unfilled based on student needs. 12 positions are for ICT classrooms, and 10 positions are assigned to either particular students or full day special classes. In 24 25, based on the enhancements to the integrated co teaching model, we will now have two teachers together throughout the day in each elementary co-teaching classroom. 
This enhancement results in a reduction of four TAs from Shelter Rock and four TAs from Muncie Park, which is reflected in the 24-25 budget. 12 positions are assigned to either particular students or full-day special classes. And as in prior years, ICT classes may have a teaching assistant based on the needs of a particular student or particular students. In addition, in 24-25, we have budgeted 2.0 growth positions that may be utilized based on student needs. Some community members have asked why the reductions in TAs were not taken in the 23-24 budget. A considerable amount of time and research was conducted throughout the 22-23 school year, and the decision to move forward with piloting the program in 23-24 was not finalized until well after the budget was adopted. We made the decision to make no changes to staffing during the 23-24 school year while we were piloting the program. Throughout 23-24 to date, we have been reviewing and evaluating the program and now feel confident in making the staffing changes to reflect the new model in 24-25. To be clear, it saddens us to recommend removing teaching assistant positions even in the context of program enhancements. The next set of reductions are recommended because of the realities of our fiscal climate and the necessity of reducing positions to achieve a balanced budget within the property tax cap. The elementary computer lab TA positions, the elementary library TA positions, the secondary school library TA position, and one secondary school departmental TA positions have been eliminated. Once again, it saddens us to recommend removing teaching assistant positions to operate within the property tax cap is critically important to acknowledge the valuable contributions of our teaching assistants. And again, I'd be remiss if I didn't once again publicly acknowledge those contributions and of course acknowledge the stress of these reductions on those impacted. Let's now uh, that we've discussed the expenditure side, take a moment to review the revenue side. The district has three primary sources of revenue state aid, which accounts for 5%, various other sources, which account for 4%, property taxes, which account for 90%, and the appropriated fund balance, which accounts for 1%. As we stated earlier, each year we receive from the Office of Real Property uh, Services a growth factor that tells us the value by which the tax base in the community has been adjusted. This year that is valued at $349,000. Sadly, and you've heard me say this repeatedly, the governor's proposed budget includes a reduction of $629,000 in foundation aid for our district, which represents a stunning 20.7% decrease in foundation aid. As you know, we've written to our local representatives. We have spoken with them. They have committed to advocate for the full restoration of state aid. With no agreement between the legislature and the governor, unfortunately, the April 1st deadline for an on-time state budget has come and gone. Therefore, the state aid picture is not any clearer than it was at our last meeting. However, this budget assumes the restoration of state aid. Should that restoration not occur, we will appropriate the difference in fund balance through our FEMA recoveries. We certainly hope a full restoration occurs as the risk in appropriating fund balance creates a significant cliff for the 24-25 budget. So you'll see over here the assumed restoration in state aid on this slide. In addition, you'll note that we are recommending increasing the assigned fund balance to remain within the property tax cap. Uh, this is opposed to impacting our educational program with incremental reductions. The risk is, as I've said before, the 24-25 budget must produce the same amount of fund balance to, uh, for sustainability moving forward. So let's review the steps we've taken to achieve a balanced budget within the property tax cap in a very difficult fiscal environment. We've created efficiencies in staffing that are necessary in this fiscal environment. We've reduced various discretionary spending lines. We will pre-purchase supplies and textbooks from 23-24 funds to reduce supply codes in 24-25. Should the state foundation aid not be restored, we have recommended that we appropriate fund balance generated as a result of FEMA recoveries to cover the $629,000 potential reduction. We've recommended that we increase the amount of appropriate fund, fund balance to achieve a balanced budget to $840,000. And as an aside, the unfunded mandate to change our team name is not budgeted. Fund balance generated as a result of FEMA recoveries 
from 2324 will be used to cover those expenses. In all instances, the use of fund balance generated in 2324 is only made possible because of our initiative, our initiative to recover COVID-related expenses through FEMA. So as we do um, every year at this time, let's just review what we've done with elementary class size. Historically, the district has utilized these class size guidelines. Uh, last year, the board, so, uh, the board formed a subcommittee, discussed forming a subcommittee, which they formed this year to discuss our guidelines. A great deal of work has gone into that subcommittee. And uh, what, what we anticipate the subcommittee to do is to affirm the class size guidelines are reasonable, but that efforts should be, should be made to maintain class sizes below the recommended guidelines whenever practical. And this budget has been built with this recommendation in mind. So importantly, all elementary sections are projected to be below the class size guidelines, including uh, projected cohort change. Specifically, as I said earlier, 3.0 elementary teachers have been added to reduce class sizes in grades five and six. So the average enrollment over 13 years at Muncie Park is 876 students. You'll note that enrollment is declining over the last five years from its height of 934 students to 815 predicted in 24-25. You'll also see on the chart on the right, the average number of sections is 41. This year we're projecting 40 sections because we've added 2.0 teachers to reduce class size in grades five and six. So this slide shows you what those class size projections are. Um, you will note again that all classes are projected to be below guidelines. You'll see that grade five has 146 students that would typically be placed in six sections with an average class size of 24.3. In grade six, we have 151 students which would typically be placed in six sections with an average class size of 25.1. And again, we've added 2.0 teachers here to be consistent with the board subcommittee, uh, their anticipated recommendation to lower class size in grades five and six. Looking at Shelter Rock, um, you will see the average enrollment is 689 students over 13 years, significant decline from its height of 777 students. Next year, enrollment is projected to be 607, which is the lowest it's been in the last 13 years. On average, Shelter Rock has had 32 sections. Next year, we're projecting 31. On this slide again, you'll see the class sizes are projected to be below guidelines in Shelter Rock. In grade five, we would typically plan for four sections with 100 students currently enrolled. This would be a grade that we would watch and we would wait until August to determine if an additional section was necessary. However, again, we have added a, uh, we've added a teacher here to be consistent with the board subcommittee's recommendation. Um, we've already made that section, uh, grade five, five sections reflecting a class size of 20. Uh, if the predicted enrollment change occurs, three classes will be at 21. Our upcoming budget meetings are here. Um, one important note, starting April 22nd, early mail uh, applications can be found on the Manhasset's website under the Board of Education Voter Information tab. Early mail ballot applications must be received by May 14th to the Manhasset District Clerk. You'll see that um, April 16th is a significant date. That is the date that the board is set to adopt the budget. Um, once the board adopts the budget, that budget is the budget that is uh, that, that is put up to the community for a vote. So that adoption will happen here in the district office community room. That meeting is on a Tuesday, not a Thursday, April 16th. May 9th is the formal budget hearing as required by law on the board's budget. And on May 21st is the annual budget vote from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. in the high school gymnasium. So I'll take any questions from the, from the board. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that informative presentation. Um, so I think we're all concerned about um, what's happening with respect to the special ed and the TA. So I just want to make sure I'm clear on what you're saying. Um, so a couple of things. So 
are we increasing the number of special ed students in a class now for next year? Or is that going to stay the same? Or, and how does that compare to other districts? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, in compared to this year's model or the previous model, compared to this year's model, the average class size will remain what it is, what it is this year, which is about seven. So we have some sections that are that are below seven. We have some sections that are above seven. There will be no more than 12. 12 is what is um, 12 is is the cap established uh, by law. Uh, we are projecting no more than 10 in any class. But again, the average is seven, which is this year's average as well. In previous years, the ICT classes were were um, uh, smaller because special class students were receiving uh, were receiving pullout special education services. So they were not in the ICT class. They were in another classroom. Then they were removed from the general education classroom to get uh, to to receive primary instruction from a special education teacher in a self-contained special class environment. So the change that we have made is those previous special class students are now in the integrated co-teaching program. So they are now part of the integrated co-teaching classroom with two full-time special education teachers. Supplemental support is now provided by a reading specialist or a math specialist because primary instruction is still being is still happening in a special education classroom. So the biggest benefit is that the special class students now receive a double dose. They receive primary instruction in a least restrictive environment with, with students that are in their grade level, and they receive supplemental instruction at a frequency determined by their IEP. Right, so I just wanted to clarify. So they're in a classroom, they'll, in, next year, they'll be in a classroom with two teachers full day, one gen ed and one special ed. Right. That's right. And in this, and this year, we are piloting that model. So in this year, there are, uh, there are formally special class students that are in integrated co-teaching classes as well. And then what about the, the makeup of the special ed students in a particular class? Um, is there like any sort of balancing going on to make sure that there isn't too much burden put on a particular classroom setting so the kids are, are receiving as much um, instruction, uh, I guess, in the most efficient and productive manner? I think an important thing to remember is that um, is that all classes have students of varying ability levels. Of course, we understand that. All classes have students of varying ability levels. The um, the benefits of heterogeneous grouping of students versus homogeneous grouping of students is well documented in research, and it is well documented in our um, in our own instructional practices. As you know, we strive to create heterogeneous groups of students. Take the gen ed side for a moment. On the gen ed side, at the elementary level, um, with the exception of the sixth grade double accelerated math program, all of our students are heterogeneously grouped. We do not have a separate group of our high achieving students, a separate group of our average students and our separate group of students who may, who may struggle. They're all heterogeneously grouped. That is the best practice model. Homogenous grouping has detrimental effects on students, um, particularly when students are isolated from their special education students, students with disabilities are further isolated from their peers when they could be in a least restrictive environment. We have an obligation, as you know, this is the related services continuum. We have an obligation to provide students with access to general education curriculum in a least restrictive environment. You'll see where integrated co-teaching is on the, uh, on the continuum here. And you'll see where special class pullouts are on the continuum. So our obligation to students is if they are able to access the general education curriculum with supports in an integrated co-teaching model, that is the appropriate setting for students. And again, we provide supplemental instruction for those, for those that require it. But the most important thing to understand is that the changes that we've made in instruction and pedagogy over the past several years particularly in ELA, particularly in the area of reading, allows for this to occur. Because 
in all of our general education classes, including our ICT classes, which is a general education setting, our, our teachers have been focused and our professional development has been focused on differentiation of instruction. So I think it's important to remember that, um, that no, no class in our building is, is hom in our district is homogenous. All of our classes are heterogeneous. Um, our teachers are well equipped to handle uh, a variety of learning levels. Those students who require special classes will receive supplemental support, which is a least restrictive environment. And you also have to remember that the average number of students in a particular class of, of students with disabilities is seven. So the average number of students in a class of students with disabilities is seven. The average class size next year is 20. So that is, that is more than management. Yeah, and I have to say, just observing over the last number of years, the differentiation that's occurred across the board through all the grades, as I think, in my opinion, has greatly expanded curriculum for all learners. Yes, and I think, again, the investment that we've made in terms of specialists, the changes that we've made in curriculum, our outcomes are, have, continued to, uh, have continued to demonstrate success at all levels. By every measure, our students are achieving more than they were previously. And all you have to do is go back to our data presentations to see that. All right, so you had mentioned um, that for students who do need that um, supplemental support, they'll receive that from either the math or the ELA specialists or reading specialists. So are those specialists equipped to, um, to uh, be able to deliver that support in a special ed setting or to a special ed student? Yeah, so again, you have to remember that primary instruction is being delivered by a special educator. So students are receiving primary instruction from a special education teacher in the general education classroom. So that's, that's the first thing. The second is that the specialists are providing supplemental support as determined at a frequency as required by a student's individual education plan. In many cases, our specialists take reading, for example. Our only Wilson certified uh, teachers, our Orton Gillingham certified teachers are reading teachers. So our reading teachers possess the, possess the, the skills, the training, the uh, knowledge of particular reading programs in order to provide that supplemental support. And they'll do it at the frequency that is determined at the CSE meeting uh, based on the individual student and their needs. And then one last question. So you mentioned the state budget. So it was due on April 1st and it was delayed, I think through today. Uh, they gave an extension because of the holiday weekend. So we haven't heard anything about that yet? Yeah. They passed the budget extender. She, uh, the governor signed it today. They expect uh, another budget extender to be signed on Sunday, actually. That will go into next week. When, when was last year's state budget approved? Do you recall? Uh, it, approximately. May. Uh, the state budget last year was was actually actually came in I believe it was five weeks late but you can you can confirm if my facts are if my facts are right uh, four or five weeks past the deadline and uh, it was after the board had adopted the budget and once again after the board adopts the budget you know that is the budget I only hope for the best at this point okay thank you thank you Jill uh, just to tack on to that inquiry. Dr. Ponce, thank you. You had mentioned that you would be monitoring the program with the data that we luckily have. Uh, Ms. Alaperdi, that monitors. What other, um, what other programs will we have in place in terms of gathering teacher feedback and student feedback to see how things are running next year and this year to see how we could have agility within the programming? Yeah, so we have long committed, and it has been our longstanding practice to do continuous evaluations of all of our programs and all of our methods of delivering instruction. So we do that in, in, in a number of ways. 
We, of course, look at student achievement data on an individual level. We look at it on a group level. Our administrators are well-trained to do that. Um, Mrs. Alaperdi uh, runs data conversations in each of our buildings focused on particular students, particular grade levels. She's joined in that work by our directors and our coordinators. We are also in classrooms regularly, and we are also in conversation with teachers regularly. So we... We continue to, we continue and will always continue to gather feedback from our teachers. And we will, and we will look at both anecdotal and objective measures to determine the success of all of our programs. That's been a longstanding practice in Manhasset and it will not stop. Um, and it's something we're committed to doing for all of our programs. Thank you. I had a question regarding uh, the FEMA monies that you had mentioned. Uh, in regard to the money that was secured, the 1.4, is the um, is that tied up in what you had mentioned in terms of the 629 for the reserves and also with the um, with the mascot, or was that tied into the budget for one-time purchases? And are you looking to leverage the, the incoming 2.7 for that? Yeah, so so two very very good questions. Um, so right now that FEMA money is 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 sitting in our in our fund balance. We plan to use some of that money to offset uh, the twenty four twenty five budget by doing the pre purchase of certain supplies. Uh, we will we will present a budget revision for the board's consideration in order to uh, to comply with the unfunded mandate of changing our team name. So we've earmarked money. For, in order to do that, which is estimated to cost about $350,000. Then we have earmarked another $629,000 to uh, offset the FEMA, I'm sorry, to offset the state aid uh, if, if, if that money is not um, restored from the governor. The rest of the money we would have to, we would discuss with the board at the end of the year, the best use is for. So typically what we do, as I said, any leftover money, we typically put towards a capital reserve, but we may consider using, using it as uh, some seed money for some other reserves that we are not currently funding. And Dr. Gurgis will make a recommendation for us. Uh, he'll present this to the board in June uh, before we close the books. He'll present his recommendation, and then the board will have an opportunity to decide uh, what the best use of funds are. Yeah, currently we uh, currently our reserve picture is uh, it's on it's uh, in this previous slide over here. You can see that we are only funding at the moment our capital reserves, and we have a very small uh, repair reserve. But there are other reserves that are that are established but not funded. Dr. Gurgis, you want to just speak about some of those other reserves? Workers compensation reserve, um, unemployment reserve. The employment, uh, the employee uh, retirement system, and the teacher retirement system sub reserves are also established uh, in the district. But as Dr. Palsy said, they are they are not funded. Um, should the district um, have excess funds and decide to deposit those monies, they can be put into those accounts to offset uh, future expenses. And you know, one consideration that we have to make, of course, having some uh, having some seed money to be able to establish the funds is great. Um, we, but using the funds without the ability to replenish them is, 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 of course, very risky. So ultimately, what has to happen is our budgets need to produce enough fund balance to be able to fund those reserves uh, so that if we do fund them, we can replenish them and we don't create the fiscal cliff that I've been talking about in previous presentations. The last year's budget, state budget, was approved May 2nd, so about four weeks late. Can you, you just refresh my memory? I, I can't recall. Um, are we funding the repair reserve for this budget? Last year, we, uh, we uh, funding from the repair reserve has come at the end of the year um, using excess fund balance. There is no dedicated budget line for the repair reserve. So we'll see if at a fund balance. Yes. Yeah, you know, uh, Jill, what you're thinking is that in previous years, we had identified a particular line that was to fund the repair reserve. We have not done that at this year's budget. Uh, 
Uh, sorry, one final question. In terms of the programming and the monitoring, what is included in the budget for growth positions in, to allow for flexibility there? That's a great question. So we have uh, two teaching assistant positions that are budgeted as uh, growth positions. We have three elementary teacher positions that are budgeted as growth slash leave positions and two secondary school teaching positions that are growth slash leave positions. So just as a reminder, you know, we employ, um, we employ about 500 people in the district and uh, with any organization that large, uh, things happen. And sometimes employees require sick, re require extended sick absences. Those leave positions are used when we are funding two employees for the same position. So in other words, if there is a person that is out on sick leave and they're receiving a full salary, and there's another person that's in their role also receiving a full salary, the, the growth positions fund that as well as potential growth. I just have a couple questions. Uh, You've said vulnerabilities a few times now when you've showed this, you know, and you're, we're making different cuts and we're making adjustments into it, but we still have some vulnerabilities. What are some of our biggest ones that you see in this budget right now that we need to be aware of? Yeah, the, the, um, the, there are a few. So uh, electricity is a vulnerability. As I said, we've taken the reduction uh, that is that, that we will get once the EPC um, savings are realized. However, um, we're not certain when these solar panels will be connected to the grid. We know they will be installed this July um, and August, but it could take several months afterwards. So, so the extent of the savings that we've taken, we, we will be, um, as the expression goes, hanging on with our fingernails uh, regarding that. So that is a vulnerability. We have allocated uh, appropriated fund balance of about $840,000. Ideally, you, are, you do not use your savings to offset your costs for next year. So ideally, we would not be using appropriated fund balance. Um, and certainly, I am, uh, I, I am uncomfortable with the fact that we are increasing it. Um, I'm comfortable with the decision that we've made because it doesn't cause us to, to take reductions in other areas of the budget. I'm uncomfortable with the concept of increasing the appropriated fund balance. But be that as it may, we have the funds available this year, so we are so so we are taking it so that we don't have to make incremental reductions. Um, the uh, so so those are those are the primary vulnerabilities in this year's budget. Uh, Dr. Gersh, is there any other vulnerability that that perhaps I missed? Barring any unforeseen circumstances, there are certainly facility uh, concerns that we always will see throughout the year, just based on the fact that. The buildings are used. Um, the buildings, uh, you know, are um, are aging. So that's always uh, an area um, of concern. I see. And quite honestly, if there are any um, outside placements that do occur, you know, that uh, that we may not be budgeted for, that's also an area that uh, that is also a focus because that could be an unanticipated cost that the district does have to address. We have also used our longstanding methodology for how we are projecting health insurance, what we're projecting to happen in health insurance. Um, but the percentage that we are using is lower than I know what um, what Dr. Gurgis was hoping to be able to use. So that is another, that that is that is the other area of vulnerability. What are the rates that we're, what, what rate are we using in the budget and what would you prefer to use? Preferably for the, the upcoming year, um, I would look to for a ten percent for the second half of the of the year. That's I don't want to say it's an industry standard, just based on some of the trends and the f really how much they they did go up for two thousand uh, twenty four. But they did go up um, by uh, nine percent and ten percent respectively for the uh, for the uh, uh, individual and family plans. So what does it include? I'm sorry, I believe um, it. I believe it's just under seven percent. The TRS we're budgeting ten percent. Yes, which is which is the rate that was provided by the retirement system. And just as a reminder for the public, the reason that um, that that health insurance is difficult to predict is because 
the health insurance is billed on a calendar year. And of course, our school budget is on a school year calendar. So we know what the rate is through December 31st. We are predicting the rate from January through uh, June 30th of the previous year. Now, our longstanding model for how we predict the rate is we use the we 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 use an average um, over the last several years. But we know that that average has been has has been really racketing up, ratcheting up. So um, so so that is why we say that seven percent perhaps is a uh, is a vulnerability. And I know. Dr. Gurgis, when you, we talked about we one of our incomes was we increased our interest income. Now, predicting that forward, are we using the same interest rates that we are seeing now, or how are we adjusting that for next year's interest rates for that income? Um, we're, we, we, we've adjusted it. I do anticipate uh, some cushion, um, considering um, that we will far exceed what we budgeted for 2023-24. Uh, um, I don't... Uh, foresee that the rates will drop down to what they did two years ago, um, in which we were really receiving minimal income. But I, I, I feel comfortable in that the interest uh, projection will get us to where we need to in the revenue line. Just based on the current climate, I know that there's a lot of discussion about, you know, are the rates going to stabilize or are they going to cut? But um, based on just where we've trended and where we think we should be, I think we're in a good spot. Feel safe. Yeah. And also the same goes on the expense side with the tax anticipation note interest as well. If the rates go down, then the same thing will happen. We will not pay as much for the tax anticipation note, so there would be a realized savings there to offset. And just another question for you, uh, Dr. Bossi, is in everything that you did there, and we had a lot of requests from departments, I just wanna again get an idea of you know, what what did we leave on the table that you wanted to fund or depart or administration or department heads asked you to fund that we were not able to handle in this budget? Sure. So um, there, there was a request for increased clerical support from various departments. Um, we were not able to allocate funds for increased clerical support. Um, and that really came from, uh, from, as I said, from various departments throughout the district. Um, we also had a, uh, a request. This is the second year in a row. We haven't been able to fund this request which is to fund a, a dean of students to support the, to support the uh, building administration and the students at the secondary school. Um, as you know, the assistant principal's office has had some uh, turnover. And in our exit interviews with the assistant principals, one of the things that they have shared with us is that uh, they feel that they are stretched uh, very thin and they feel that they need uh, an additional set of hands to make the position manageable and doable. Um, as you know, our building at the secondary school is 1,500 students. If you looked at uh, comparable high schools, uh, secondary schools with 1,500 students, in many cases, they do have a, another level of support for students in a, uh, in a dean position. So uh, it was disappointing to us to not be able to fund that because we recognize how important it is uh, for the operations, the smooth operations, successful operations of the secondary school. And if we get this, if by chance we get this funding back, there's a chance also to have that 3% increase that usually comes with it, which is about a hundred grand. If we get that back, obviously we're gonna take care of the fund balance with the 629 that we're giving ourselves that aspect, but that hundred grand, where do you, where should we be putting that? Yeah, you know, um, we, we really should look to fund uh, positions that will have the, the, the greatest impact on students. And um, I think that uh, I think that funding a dean of students would be a uh, would impact the most students. And I think that 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 would be my recommendation um, if we were to receive an increase in state aid above the six hundred and twenty nine thousand dollars. Jill, just to answer your question, 6.97 as a straight average. All right. Uh, so at this time, it's open to the floor for comments and questions in regards to just the presentation. Uh, we please ask that you keep your questions to three minutes or less. 
uh, please state your name, your affiliation uh, with at the 30 second mark. I'll casually raise my hand just to give you a, a warning uh, so you know where you are in time. Uh, if anyone would like to come up, now is the time. Hi, I'm Jen Herber. I have uh, two kids in the district. And um, I wanted to ask about the budget. Did you build it off of 2023 to 2024 budget or actuals? I do have a slide that shows here's what we actually did last year, and then here's what we're projecting for the next year. Um, so we uh, so so we do a line by line analysis of our of our budget. Uh, most of our budget is uh, zero based uh, budgeting. So in other words, we budget by employee. We but we budget by their particular health uh, health insurance selection or declination. Um, we do the same for our special education students. We budget by. I just want to know, like, student, did you look at an actual and we budget? Uh, in terms of the other non-compensation items in the budget, uh, we do a line-by-line -line analysis for each department. So when you do line-by-line, -line, do you look at actual versus budget? So when I looked at the presentations online, what I saw was um, a budget for, for uh, last year and then a budget for this year. So, well, I saw three budgets in a row. I saw two budgets and then a budget projected for next year. And I'm trying to understand, did you look at the actuals that came in for June 2023 and then say? So what we do is we look at actual expenditures from 22-23. And then what we do is we budget for 23-24. We look at the budget for 23-24. And then we, we list a proposed budget for 24-25. We then go you through and list like the that variance us. and the dollar amount for each. And yeah, once the budget is finalized, uh, adopted by the board on April 16th, we will publish on our website the uh, complete blue book, which is a, a breakdown of all of that. You can see last year's on um, uh, on the website now, but 24-25 will be posted once the board decides what the uh, uh, what budget they're adopting. And the reason I'm asking is because um, seeing two years of budget and then the budget projected seemed a little odd. So I went back and I, I checked, you know, why are you showing not an actual a budget for the finishing this year and then a budget for next year? And there were a lot of places where uh, we are kind of matching the two budget years. And um, that would seem to make sense if you generally came in where your budget was projected, uh, then you know, you're expecting this year you'll land at the budget and then the following year you might project it to be the same. And there were just a number of places where we were, there was significant variance. Um, so there was, like 200,000 of extra expenditures in business administration, 319,000 extra for legal. This is for the year ended 2023. Um, obviously we don't know what 2024 is, but there were a lot of extra expenditures and then we assumed those went away. And then there were actually a lot of savings. Like we didn't spend as much on instruction, 440,000 on instruction and 440,000. That's a lot of money, you know, when you're worried about 629,000 from the, from the state. We, we didn't spend as much as we expected. We're on three minutes still. Okay. So I guess what I'm saying is um, I would love to see the actual for 2023 and then the budget for 2024 and then the budget for the following year so that we could figure out whether um, there are places where we didn't spend what we thought we did. Like, for instance, on instruction or transportation, we saved 325000 And so all of that gets washed away if you do budget, 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 then you're budgeting off of something that didn't happen that way. And it seems like there's a lot of savings there. Maybe they were offset by some of the expenses, but it seems misleading to present it that way. I looked at other districts, they don't present it that way. They present actual budget, budget. Now you'll be able to see exactly what you're asking for after the board adopts the budget on April 16th. Um, but again, I would say, if you look at our blue book, and you look at the detail of the footnotes that explain every single expenditure that we've budgeted, it's far more detailed than most of our comparators. Thank you. Good evening, you guys. I'm Luca Altamira, sophomore Manhattan High School. 
As I spoke at the last meeting, I asked the board to reconsider these cuts made to TAs. To add on to that tonight, here is a question. If we do not have these TAs, the question is who will run CAP in both Shelter Rock and Manhattan Secondary School? Although the suggestion is to have CAP during the summer, what about those kids who look forward to go after school to CAP, who also love CAP, who enjoy going to sharing laughs, playing kickball, or board games with one another, as well as hanging out with their friends? In addition, who will help run unified sports and cheer those kids on the court and off the court? Who will run the testing center where TAs help breed to some students? Not only do these TAs not make a lot, this budget cut will be cutting 14 TAs. These TAs are lifelines for some students. And without these TAs, who is going to make sure kids with disabilities get safely on the bus and get safely home? My final point is that without TAs, who will help manage all these programs and services provided to students? That's why I asked the board once again to help please reconsider this proposal and to find other ways to cut the budget to avoid cutting 14 TAs, who are also desired by the Manhattan community. As I stated before, these are people at the end of the day, and I asked the school to really reconsider this. Thank you so much, Luca. We, we always appreciate your comments and we appreciate that you attend so many of our board meetings and that you're actively involved in, uh, in, in, in this arena as well as in the high school. So um, I wanna just uh, answer a few, of your, uh, a few of your questions. I think I've gotten them all, but I'm happy to speak with you um, uh, privately if there's anything that I've missed. So, uh, so first, I think it's important to recognize that the TA positions that we are reducing are outlined on this slide over here. So we are not reducing any one-to-one -one TA positions. We are not reducing positions that are in the uh, testing center in terms of reading to reading to students um, and providing those testing accommodations. None of that is being reduced. What we are reducing primarily from special education is we are reducing four TAs from Shelter Rock for the ICT program because we've changed the ICT program. We're reducing four TAs from Muncie Park because we've changed the uh, ICT program over at Muncie Park as well. The other TA reductions are not special education reductions. The other TA reductions are reductions in general education settings. So we are reducing an elementary computer lab, the elementary computer lab teaching assistance that is not a special education teaching assistant. The uh, elementary library teaching assistants, the secondary school library teaching assistants, and the secondary school departmental teaching assistants are not special education services. Those are general education supports. I agree with you that these are real people. They have made valuable contributions. And as I've said repeatedly, um, it, it pains us to be in a fiscal environment where we are forced to make reductions to balance the tax cap, to, to, be, to balance our budget, to be within the tax cap. We had to remove $1 million in spending from our budget, primarily due to the fact that we, primarily due to the fact is that we had very few retirements to offset our increases in compensation and benefits that occur year to year. And also the significant driver is um, special education out of district placements that are um, very necessary and we have to fund them and also very expensive. So those are unique challenges to this, to this fiscal year. Um, with respect to, with respect to uh, unified sports and with respect to, uh, with respect to CAP, we agree those are both very valuable programs and uh, we assure you that we will work very diligently to make sure that they are appropriately staffed. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. So I'm Grace Muskie, and this is Shaylee, and we're eighth grade students in the secondary school. And I guess that we just wanted to bring up how we heard about these cuts, and we were just kind of disappointed, I guess, because I'm good friends with someone in the special education program, and I'm good friends with one of the TAs in my classes, and I know she's a lot of help. And you were addressing how when the TAs are cut, there would be teachers to go to, but I feel like it's like I don't feel as comfortable going to teachers as I do TAs because they're, they're more, more like friends. Like yeah, friends. They're more like 
they're like, more comfortable i'm more yeah, comfortable and speaking also to the them general teachers like focused on their job which is like to provide help to the students with like the subjects such as like art or math yeah so also there like are incidents where reporting them to teachers wouldn't work because they're more focused on 25 kids when teachers assistants are focused on really being personable with the kids and personable to the special education for example just a few weeks ago um on the bus one of my friends who's in special education was just getting told to do embarrassing things and getting videoed um one of the other girls in our class who isn't in special education she was comfortable to tell one of the tas um, she was really comfortable to tell her that this was happening and so that she could help prevent it. Otherwise, like it could be posted on TikTok and that's not good. So uh, thank you. And, th and thank you both for having the courage to speak. And thank you for speaking so beautifully about our teaching assistance. As I said previously, uh, we agree that uh, we, have, we employ some, some really fantastic people. So I wanted to uh, address two things that you've raised. First, uh, there are no uh, special education teaching assistant cuts at the secondary school. The, the special education teaching assistant cuts are occurring as a result of a change in model at the elementary buildings. We will still have 22 teaching assistant positions at the secondary school to support students with disabilities. We have the reductions that are happening at the secondary school is the reduction of a library teaching assistant and the reduction of a departmental teaching assistant. That is it. The reductions are occurring at the elementary level because of an enhanced integrated co-teaching model. So thank you. Yeah, uh, we just really wanted to stress how important teaching assistants are to not only the special education kids, but to help out us when we're stressed or when mm -hmm. we're just have too much workload. But thank you for really hearing us out. And thank you for your comments. We really appreciate your perspective. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stephanie Yakovone. I'm the MESPA president. I think what they were trying to say is some of the positions that are held at the secondary school, they are of the bottom 14. So the positions may be there, but the people will not be there. And I think that's what they're... So they're very fortunate that they are able to keep those positions. But I do want to go back to the um, ICT classes and discuss those. I had this whole speech, I'm not going there. I understand together as a unit with the co-teachers, which is the full-time teacher and the co-teacher, and we have these specialists and they are amazing. But part of that unit is the TAs because the math teacher does not push in every day. The reading teacher does not push in every day. Actually, I think the kids are taken out. I'm not sure. And I just wanna say we're lucky enough because almost every co-teach TA is behind me. So if anybody has questions, they are here. But I just want to say that part of the data that you guys are getting is part of that portion of it is the support of the TAs. And I love the idea because we see it. We have those aha moments. I'm in the library, my job is gone. But I used to be in special ed. And the best thing about special ed is when you have that aha moment. And we all have them. And you can tell we're very passionate about it. But we are part of that support that is here. We are part of that data that you're getting so I'm curious to see without the support when those specialists aren't in that room and there are only two teachers, what the atmosphere will be like, because that's where we come in. And if somebody needs to be read to, or somebody needs extra time, or somebody just needs to go out for a walk, just from the pressure of trying to take a test, there's all these different avenues. And with just two teachers there, you can have up to 40% in a classroom or 12 people. So if it's 20 kids in a classroom, it's still 40%. That is the state law. So figuring that out right now, there's some classes that do have six, but there's some that have eight. And then they have kids that also push in. So it's quite an undertaking. And there are TAs in those rooms. If there's a one-on-one, -on -one, 
but that TA is strictly with the one-on-one. -on -one. If there's a two-on-one, -on -one, it's strictly with the two-on-one. -on -one. So I just want everybody to remember as you go along and decide on this budget that part of those great numbers and those reading numbers and those math numbers, yes, um, it's the teachers, but it's also the support from the TAs reinforcing all of that. And that's my speech. Thank you very much. Uh, would anyone else? I wasn't. I wasn't going to speak. My name is Tina Karajanis. Too close. Um. So my kids went through the system. Oh eight. 2013 and 2018. Um, I love my school. I love my community. I This year I am new and I am a teacher's assistant. Um, I wanted to give back, to be honest with you, because what a great system it is. So what a TA, I, there's a little bit of a disconnect for me. The parents really don't know what TAs do. Um, just a couple of things, and I haven't, I don't have anything prepared. It just has scribble scrabble. Um, when I went in, what we do is we build relationship with the teacher. We allow her, we, it's a give and take. It's a kind of dance in the classroom. Um, we allow her to do her teaching and not be distracted. Uh, there's then the second element, which is all about the kids, is really connecting with the kids. Allow them to trust us the TAs enough in the classroom. And at that point, the world is their oyster. I believe that their safety and their learning is number one. Uh, TAs, I believe, are an integral part of that system. Uh, we are, like I said before, we are the boots on the ground. Um, we're the eyes and ears for the teachers to actually teach and do their wonderful job. It is a pleasure every day, and it's an honor every day to be there. Um, one of the teachers, you have the letters. Please read them from the teachers. Um, one of the teachers said, it's the backbone of our classroom. Uh, we provide emotional as well as academic learning. Um, we do modifications on the spot. We got to be quick. Um, we anticipate the child and their needs. For example, one student, I saw he was not doing well. The teacher was doing her, her lesson plan. She was not aware. I took the child, went outside, asked him to breathe with me. He went in and he could continue. This is what we do. We care so much about them. Um, everything and their well-being we do prompting, we do redirecting, we manage behaviors, we scaffold the assignments. Uh, the teachers and I, we, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous, I apologize, but it is such a dance that we do in that classroom and it's all for their learning. Please, is, if there's any way possible, I believe that do not take away personnel. It is for their detriment. I believe, I don't know what's gonna happen next September. I don't know if more kids come in and they need the teachers. We need to rally around that. And I just wanna say thank you. And it's such a tough job, Ms. Rushforth, you're, you're exiting and you know, congratulations, but I don't want your legacy you know, in, this, in this environment. And it's a very tough environment. I don't envy you, I, you know, I really don't. And, it's a hard thing to let go of 14, but the TAs are a lot more, we have worth in that classroom. The teachers depend on us. They need to teach. We need to step back and assist them, but mostly for the children. So that's, that's all I have to say. And I thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Thank you. So again, um, these these aren't easy decisions. Uh, I know 
the administration has worked on many different ways of trying to make sure we can provide the best to the entire student body. Uh, this is something the school board we have to weigh heavily on us that we'll continue to talk about and look into between now and next week when we adopt the budget. Um, again, it, we always talk about the fa family, the Manhasset family, and, and just here in Luca and two young ladies who came up here and, and spoke and the impact that TAs have within the community, within the school is definitely felt up here. Uh, and it's, we're in some difficult circumstances and we're trying to do the best that we can for the school, the community, uh, but that doesn't lessen the appreciation and everything that you guys bring every day. And we are thankful for that. And we're gonna continue to do whatever we can. Um, again, I, we can't make any promises, but we are trying to do whatever we can. So thank you. So moving on, tonight we had the gift. We already did the gift to the district uh, policy review. Um, okay, so we have one new policy on the agenda for, well, two really. One's the policy, one is the regulation that goes along with it. Um, policy, one sec, I have to pull up the numbers. We have um, 4327 is a first reading um, and 4327R, this, the regulation, these are um, the homebound instruction um, policy. There were some changes to state law, um, which required us to update our policy. The major changes are um, what is required to apply for homebound instruction. Um, basically the number of um, hours predicted for you to be out of school based on uh, medical um, requirements um, was changed to 10 hours uh, in a month. In addition, the hours required to be provided of homebound instruction um, increased from five hours a week in the elementary school to 10 hours or one hour a day to two hours and then 10 hours per week in the secondary school to 15 hours per week um, or from two to three hours per day. Um, the other change was just in the title. Um, we have now hired Ms. Peterson to be our executive director of student services. So um, the title change is also reflected in the new policy and the regulation. Uh, any questions on that? Um, I would like to see if we haven't gotten it already, um, maybe some input or comments from administration because uh, when I did a quick reading of it earlier today, uh, it impacts a lot of moving parts, a lot of uh, different departments, health office, the, uh, the principals, um, special ed, guidance, payroll even. So um, maybe just having it circulate a little bit just so we can get some comments from everybody would be helpful. Okay, um, Allison did review it maybe we'll send it out to everybody that's involved in the regulation. It literally lists every step and what offices are. So for the next reading, we'll do that. Um, and then we also have 10 uh, policy 1050, which um, is the same as last year, the annual budget vote um, policy and school board elections. And there was no changes to what we um, had on there for the second reading. I do apologize though, we did discuss just changing the title of section seven, which said absentee and early mail ballots to just ballots. Um, and I thought that I had made that change and sent it to be put on the agenda, but apparently the copy I sent did not have that change. So we can vote on it tonight, acknowledging that we are just changing the title of section seven from absentee and early mail ballots to just ballots. Any questions on that? We're okay with that. All in favor of uh, policy 1050? All right, it's unanimous. And then we'll move the uh, 4327 and 4327R to a second reading for next week. Uh, brings us right to board discussions, audit committee. We have, we, didn't meet after the last update okay. from the last meeting. Uh, finance? Um, finance, we did meet last week to go over um, 
we went over, um, let's see, March 26th, we reviewed the superintendent's preliminary budget with the, uh, with the group. We did not have a quorum, unfortunately, so we were not able to take any action, um, but we did just do an informal review for the people who were there. Um, hopefully, we will have a quorum for the next meeting, which is scheduled for April 9th. Please, um, uh, if at all possible, please uh, be sure to be there if you are on that committee. Really appreciate it because we cannot perform business without a quorum. And how long is the term on that committee? Uh, it's a three year term, three -year I think. Term? Yeah. Uh, Mac. Yeah, we didn't make yeah, Mac we before. Uh, SCA? SCA had something. Um, SCA. The SCA fair is Saturday, May 4th. We are still looking for some adult volunteers to help on the day of the fair. Please reach out to fair at manhassetsca.org. Hopefully we got all of our rain for the entire spring this week, and we're going to have a beautiful day that day. Um, also, there are limited game booths still available for fair sponsorship. Visit manhassetsca.org for information. When I looked at the list, I'm just of all the chair people for the SCA uh, that are going to be taking over different areas of it. There, I I noticed that it was a lot of that there wasn't any husbands stepping up. Am I correct in seeing that? Okay, <laughs> because like I volunteered to do the hot dog, and I've realized that it's not just selling hot dogs. There's a lot going on in that. And then I looked down the list, and not a single other husband of an elementary school kid stepped up to do anything so that, that that that's something that it you know you guys do so many great things and like in the time that you put in and all everyone that you got all of you put in the fact that you guys are re-volunteering to run these things also is concerning but the fact that we can't get anyone that group to step up that's even more concerning you know yeah <laughs> that, i'm hoping they're listening and watching like I, I, I've been through elementary school. My kids are, my kids are out, but like that's, that is running the dunk tank, running the pie. Like those, those are great events to run there. Like if we don't have volunteers to do this stuff, the SCA fair is not going to exist. And the SCA provides so much for our schools. And I don't know if there's parents that are out there that just think that it's going to run itself, but like we need people to step up and it, sh and it should be the younger parents that are stepping up and running these things. I'm yeah. calling you guys out. Like, you guys got to step up and do something, you know? To add to that, just so you know, the SCA fair is the biggest fundraising source for the SCA. Yeah. Ted stepped up. He stepped up to the school board. He's got elementary school kids. You're off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> I did one of those last year. I think I was the pie guy, so it was it was not that it's fun, but I did it. <laughs> yeah. So... No, let, let's get the horn. Let's get around. Um, and we'll talk about that hot dog stand. So Tower Foundation. No updates? Okay. Pace? So uh, Allison and Dr. Dinda, thank you for meeting with the families this uh, past Tuesday. Uh, regarding the ICT classrooms, the programming, it was very informative. And PACE also has a tennis program, an adaptive tennis program. It's running a few sessions in April and May and June. And the email is yayafan, F-A-N, at gmail.com. Uh, PACE also has, it's sponsored by the SCA and PACE, and it's completely booked with Dr. Chowski. It's the summer college essay program. So thank you, Dr. Chowski. And I was so excited to hear that it's completely booked. So that's really exciting. Uh, and another thing with PACE that was shared is the school store at Shelter Rock that PACE sponsors. Um, and those are updates with PACE. I actually wanted to ask Connie, oh, she left. Oh, no, she's not here. She left. I wanted to ask. I, I wasn't able to go uh, yesterday how the screenagers went. Does anybody know how that went? Well, yesterday she had a screening of screenagers. Um, I heard a lot of people were going, so I was really excited to hear about that. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it. I just wanted to pull up the other updates with um, Casa. She has two more Zooms coming up. 
Um, and I wanted to thank, it was uh, Rich for sending out the blast now. She's having a lot of attendance with her uh, Zooms and her in person. So with CASA, she has an upcoming um, Zoom, my apologies, a parenting series on April 11th at 7.30 via Zoom uh, regarding teen dating and also Shed the Meds event on Saturday, April 13th, 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. at Shelter Rock School. Great. Uh, CIC Tech, I know we haven't met. Uh, EOC, we haven't had any meetings since the last one. And you want to give the team name committee update? Okay. So we were just finalizing um, moving toward the next phase, which is the community poll. So that will be coming in the coming weeks. Um, we are envisioning it opening uh, Monday, April 15th, and closing on Sunday, April 21st. Um, and we worked on a promotional plan to make sure that we got the word out. Uh, so it will consist of Connect Ed, which is the email blast that comes from the school, um, articles of the Manhasset Press, Manhasset Times, social media, um, search on Facebook and Instagram. Um, we're hoping to reach out to our partners, uh, sports par athletic partners, PAL baseball, lacrosse, uh, Manhasset soccer, and we'll be reaching out to the SCA and Tower to also help us spread the word. All right, moving on, personnel schedule. Uh, everyone had a chance to review the personnel schedule. All in favor? Uh, we also have a resolution there to appoint Laura Peterson as Executive Director of Student Services. All in favor? Now it's official. <laughs> Congratulations. Another picture? You good? <laughs> um, and resolution to approve the agreement. All in favor? Okay. Consent agenda. Scrolling through, take a look there. PSC. Board of Co-op, Program Scope, Risk Assessment, Warren Treasurer's Financial. All in favor of the consent agenda? There we go. Again, no special note is the next meeting is a Tuesday. Uh, we have to also approve, I believe, the BOCES budget yeah. that day. So that's why it is on a Tuesday uh, of that week. And then our formal budget will adopt the uh, the budget and based on presentations and any feedback that we have from from anyone there and then on uh may 9th we'll have a formal budget hearing and then on the 21st is the uh the vote the election so with that said we have now reached public comment portion of uh our meeting so if anyone would like to come up and make comment name affiliation uh please be respectful of your comments of staff students and faculty, and the floor is yours. All right. How many students do we have in the elementary school? Yeah, 1,400? We have 801 students. All right, there are 1,400 elementary school dads out there. I'm sorry, like that's, there's 1,400 elementary school dads. Step up, like that's ridiculous. It truly is, 1,400. All right, mo mean motion to adjourn? All right.